Good morning again. <clears throat> so about a hundred miles deep in the earth, there's a lot of heat and pressure. A lot of heat and pressure. But under this immense heat and pressure, we find these things called carbon atoms. And I'm no scientist now, but there's a lot of science behind it. But these carbon atoms are crushed underneath this heat and this pressure. And you know what they form? Diamonds. That's what happens. They form these diamonds. So these diamonds are created in their raw form in carbon. Again, I'm being very simple here. If you're a scientist, I don't mean to insult your intelligence. But basically, these carbons are crushed under heat and pressure. And then they're, they form diamonds in their raw form. And, and people dig for these. They dig for them. And as they, it's, uh, they don't dig far because what happens is a lot of that heat or through these steam vent valves when you have volcanoes and things like that, they rise through the surface and these rocks come up with them. And so you start to don't have to dig too deep to find them. And so they find them in their raw form. And then when they're in their raw form, they take these diamonds and they these jewelers, they'll take them and people will sell them for a high cost and then they'll cut them with really specific blades and knives and things like that, just real specific. And, and what they do is when they cut them, then they shine them, they buff them. And what is presented is a really beautiful diamond that people pay a lot of money for. A lot of money for that. Godly character is really also constructed under a lot of heat and pressure. A good godly character is also constructed under a lot of heat and pressure. Except that the heat and pressure, in this case, comes from the things that weigh upon us in our lives. Now, how many of you today really are often, through your life, pressed down by a lot of heat and pressure? It's life. It's part of it. It's part of what happens with our life. You know, the famous poet and philosopher, his name was Henry David uh, Thoreau, wrote this. He says, you can't dream yourself into a character. You must hammer and forge yourself one. You can't dream about a character. You must hammer and forge yourself one, he says. And then author Emma Jameson writes this, we need to remember that circumstances don't make a person. They reveal a person. Sir, yeah, you know this because when you're driving down the road, you have a happy day and you're going along and you're driving down the road and you're jamming to the Christian radio or whatever and somebody cuts you off and that'll reveal your character pretty quick. So you laugh because you know it's true. All of a sudden, the countenance because what are you doing? Get out, beep, beep, get out of the way. Characters revealed through stressful times. It really is. But I want to talk to you today, however, about rough and stressful times are also required to build character. They don't just reveal it, but they're required to build it. Like the beautiful diamond we talked about. But some of us are really crushed sometimes under that pressure. We fold and we give into it. We give up because of our surroundings. The pressure and the heat become too hard for us. And we become not those diamonds, but just the stones, the residue that where, where the carbon was under that immense heat and pressure. And, and it didn't evolve into the thing that it was supposed to evolve to. It just became a stone. You want to be diamonds? You want to be stones? I don't know about you, but I want to be a diamond. But I want to be God's diamond. Amen? I want to be God's diamond. So, you know, all real building projects, they're messy. How many of you ever reconstructed your home? Have you ever done any kind of reconstruction? They're messy. But here's the thing about reconstruction projects, though, that I, you know, just by virtue of the word reconstruction, you got to tear down before you build up. 
You got to tear. See, but when you, th that makes all the sense in the world. You sit down and you make plans and you write these plans out and you see them and you say, okay, we got to tear this wall down, tear this. I like doing that, man. Whew, tearing things down, building them up, that becomes tough, right? And you got to clean up all the stuff and all the. Tearing down is, is pretty cool when you talk about a project, but it hurts when you talk about your character. You see, our character is such that we are born into sin. And because we're born into sin, we're built and we, we are conformed to a character that God never designed for us. So that character is something that has to be torn down completely before it can be built back up in Christ. We have to tear that character down. And, and this is the power that God has given us. As Christians, we don't conform to the patterns of the world. We don't conform to the patterns of this world. As Christians, we have a different model. And who's that model? Christ. Jesus Christ is that model who not only gives us some handles on the characteristics of a child of God, but also helps us to understand what we need to be built up into the image of God. The image of God is called the Imago Dei. That was the original design of God. Let's say it together. Imago Dei. Say that. Imago Dei. It was the original design of God. You know what that original design was? You know, I was testing the mic <clears throat> earlier, and I was walking around, and I was testing it. And as I was testing it, I told her, uh, yeah, that's perfect. You know, we can use things like perfect sound, oh, perfect breakfast, perfection Honda. But when you talk about perfection in our belief and in what Christ has for us, we qualify that by the world and not by what God talks to us about. Perfection is a life in complete obedience with God. Do you realize that was the image that God created us in? Perfect perfect relationship which results in a perfect obedience results which results in a blessing to god completely and so the character we have to tear this down we have to tear this down we are that carbon atom being crushed under the pressure under the heat of all these things. How many of us want to run from pressure and heat? Yeah, I need a vacation. I want to go fishing. You know, I, this is way too much stress for me. And then I'm not saying vacations are bad. But don't retreat to the stuff of the world. Retreat to God. We retreat to God. Not to the stuff of this world. My vacation... May be nice at a lake fishing. It ain't going to save me. My vacation going to Disneyland. You know, I don't know about you, but going to Disneyland, that's tiring for me. Going to Disney World, you know, that's tiring for me. My wife loves it, but I it's like walking all the time. You know, but anyway, that's not going to save me. Retreat to God is going to save me. A retreat to God is going to save me. You know, as long as we're growing in Christ, our character will always be under construction. Our character will always be under construction as long as we're growing in God. So you know that perpetual remodel that you're doing that just never seems to end? Make that a reminder that that's what God is doing for our character. He's doing that for our character if we just let him. When we love Jesus, his character begins to define us. We are like helpless children looking upon their daddy for guidance. When we allow the character of God to be built up in us, we learn to love the things he loves. We learn to be concerned about the things he's concerned about. His desires become our desires. The old is gone, the new has come. But it takes a concentrated effort, and on our part, which is driven by the one 
in whom we believe. We must learn to think differently. We must learn to treasure and guard what we've learned. We must learn to intentionally think about where we spend our time and who we spend it with. We must intentionally and always assess the fruit that we produce, that we might lay them down before the Lord, that He might judge and assess it and make correction against it. So if we'll pay attention and focus on God's Word through the next four weeks, God's going to begin to reconstruct our character. How many of us feel like sometimes we've arrived? Be careful. Be careful that you stand lest you fall. God says, we should always come before God in humility. So if we apply ourselves these next four weeks, you know, this was kind of an introduction to the fact that we're going to talk about a character and a construction. And the things we're going to talk about here are controlling our thoughts. This morning, we'll talk about controlling our thoughts. Next week, we'll talk about guarding our hearts. And after that, we'll talk about keeping good company. And then, of course, assessing the fruits of our spirit. Amen? Those are the things we're going to be talking about over the next four weeks. Now, I want you, though, to remember that as we go through these things, as we go through these upcoming weeks, that we're speaking of learning from a Christian perspective. These are not techniques. These are not techniques that can be applied to make you a better person. That's not what we're talking about here. These are principles that built on a foundation of believing and loving Jesus Christ will change us from inside. Amen? Will change us. These are principles based on a desire to please God that we might continue to be built up into maturity. Answering the call to achieve God's will for our lives. Have you ever, that's a, that's a, that's a really scary question, isn't it? God, what is your will for my life? That's a scary question for some people. What is your will for my life? How many of us have really taken the time rather than planning your days and planning your time and planning everything about you and everything your, your family has going on? What if you were just to ask the question of God, God, what is your will for my life? You know, some of us don't ask that question because we're afraid of the answer. God's got a plan for each of us. We need to ask that question. What's your will for my life, Lord? So as we go through these next weeks and talking about a character under construction, remember you're never done. You're never finished. God is always working on us. He works on us in all the instances of our life when people cut us off, when people are rude to us, when things, things happen that don't go our way. He is working in our lives. You know, an aircraft took off from uh, LaGuardia Airport and almost at once hit a flock of geese. The pilot, his name was Chesley Sullenberger. You probably heard or may even watch the movie. But he made several lightning fast decisions and performed dozens of complex moves, according to you know, some people who were interviewing him, uh, in just a few minutes. He did it in just a few minutes. And the plane landed safely in the Hudson River. How many of you remember that story? Yeah, it was all over the news. And, and uh, lots of people said it was a miracle. Now, and, and, and I wouldn't for a moment say that, you know, God didn't intervene, and that wasn't a miracle from God in that whole process, and that he wasn't involved. He was. He's absolutely involved. But the reason the plane safely landed was that Sullenberger had been flying planes and gliders for a very long time, and he had taught a lot of other people to do it. And so he'd done this over 30 years. Think of this. His character had formed so that all these complex thoughts and actions were second nature. Were just second nature to him. I think about these guys that fly in the military. They fly, and Jeremiah, my son, tells me a little bit about some of them. He meets them or whatever the case may be. They, 
they act as if they're really in war. Because if they don't act like they're really in war, then they won't be really prepared for war. So when they're flying these planes, these maneuvers and things that they do, they are really trying to work through that as if though it was real life. See, Sullenberger did that. He modeled these things. He taught these things. And, and, and we don't teach for the norm. We teach for the anomalies, for the things that could go wrong. But his thinking was so much that he trained this so much that it was just second nature to him. What's second nature to us whenever we get cut off? with a car or, you know, somebody treats us bad. What's the second nature there? He had control of his thoughts. You know, I do imagine, though, that he was tempted. <clears throat> Human, tempted. Tempted to think about, oh, man, I'm going down. I'm going to die. This could be the last day of my life. I haven't even talked to my family. You know, and the brain's funny that way. It thinks on a hundred millionths of a second, right? It just thinks. But the thing that overcame him... I believe this with all my heart, and I believe he talked about this. He had lives that were in his hands. So execute what you know. Do what you know. Filter the thought and focus on the work ahead of you. As Christians in the construction of our character, we like Chesley Sullenberger, you know, we have to learn to control our thoughts. We have to learn to control our thoughts. How many of you in here really believe that they control their thoughts really well? Don't raise your hand. We have opportunity. We all have opportunity to control our thoughts, especially as we believe in Jesus Christ. Especially, not control our thoughts for the sake of controlling our thoughts, but controlling our thoughts for the sake of who we believe in, who our foundation is based on. Turn with me to Philippians 4.8. <clears throat> the word says finally brothers and sisters whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure Whatever is true, whatever is admirable, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. See, the Word is helping us understand. Paul is helping us understand what we need to think about. Let's read that one more time. Let's go through it. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. You know, in this text, God's word tells us what we need to think about, what our thought life ought to be. Do you realize as a Christian you have a thought life? As a Christian, we all ought to have a thought life. It ought to be a life filled with God. Amen? A life filled with God. I know people often say things like we should think about things before we speak, but the truth is that... <laughs> We think more than we speak. We think more than we speak. You know, think about this. We don't always speak what we think, praise God. But we don't think always, we don't speak always what we think. We, however, are always thinking. We are always thinking. There's always something going through our minds. So what we're talking about today is not about not thinking. What we're talking about today is controlling those thoughts. Controlling those thoughts so that we can control what comes out of our mouths and thus our actions. Let's go through this text. Whatever is true, whatever is noble. Think about such things in accordance with the fact and reality. He's saying true. 
things that are fact and reality. What is fact and reality to a Christian? Eternal truths are spoken by God. Eternal truths are spoken by God. How do we know what's true? We've got His Word. We know what's true by His Word. Not truths related to whether Trump or Hillary told a lie. That's not the truths we're talking about. We're talking about eternal truths. And I, can, I know people argue about that kind of stuff politically, and whether somebody told a lie or somebody told, didn't tell a lie. But at the end of the day, does it really matter? The truths of God, truths about love, truths about joy, truths about peace. 1 John 3, 9 tells us one truth that we should remember. He says, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. That's a truth. That is a truth from the word of God. I admonish you to memorize it. I admonish you to tattoo it on your hearts. I admonish you to say it this week. It is a truth of God. Things that are noble, venerable, which is really according to a great, according a great deal of respect, right? Wisdom, character, serious. That's what noble means. Take life seriously. Think clean humor. Humor's okay as long as it's clean. Living in light of eternity, not temporal things. Our life and life of, with God, that He loves us, is, is not, that's not for entertainment. Somebody's life is not for entertainment. You know, I don't know about you all, but man, sometimes when I think about no, nobility, now I'm going to start digging into people's personal lives here, so forgive me, kind of. UFC, boxing, football, wrestling, TV shows that are, what do they call them? They call them, what do you call them? No, actually they're, 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 they're reality shows. Yeah, sometimes I need help from the audience. The reality shows. But you think about these things. Why do people watch them? America's Funniest Videos. People get hurt. People are beating on each other. People. In my mind, I don't know so much about that. I feel, in my heart, I feel like I'm being entertained by two people that are killing each other. And I'm thinking to myself, maybe it's just me, but this life is not for entertainment in that way. Their lives are important to God. And, and, and I don't want to encourage that. I don't want to encourage that. So this is not the way the world thinks. And I guarantee you there are Christians, maybe even in here, that say, now you're going a little too far. What's the harm in something like that? Well, I'm not telling you to change your mind. I'm not telling you to change. I'm telling you to let the Lord do what he wants to in your heart. But for me, I don't know about that stuff. Would I be okay if my kids were practicing UFC in front of me? No, but I'm okay with those guys on the TV doing it. Well, they're adults. They've chosen to do it, you know, that kind of thing. But to entertain me, not so sure for me. But see, that's an example of renewed thinking, different thinking about what human life is really all about. See, that's nobility, noble. Think of noble thoughts. Like there is a reality of heaven and there is a reality of hell. Then he says, whatever is right and whatever is pure, think about things that are right, right as it relates to God. He's the only one that is righteous. We have, only, we have nothing good in us except God, and, and that is not of our own doing, but His mercy. Those are the things that are right. Think of things that are pure, he says. 
Pure thoughts keep our minds morally and undefiled. Matthew 5.28 tells us this. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. See, but nobody sees a man looking at another woman lustfully or even thinking about that except the man. That's why Jesus called upon it. Matthew 5.23 says, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Thinking about that is even wrong. Anger starts in the heart and the mind and begins with a selfish motive. How, how they hurt me or what they did to me. And then he goes on and he says, whatever is lovely and whatever is admirable. Think about such things as lovely is admirable. Lovely, there is only time... You know, this is the only time the New Testament words uses this, this word lovely, actually. It's the only time it uses this word lovely. And it means pleasing, agreeable, and attractive. In context with what the word is telling us, God's truth and righteousness should be the only thing that's attractive. God's truth and righteousness should be the only thing that's attractive to us. Attractiveness with the lens uh, and the filter of the evil one are all those things that please us. Attractiveness with a lens and filter of Christ are all those things that please God. Think of things that are admirable, he says. The Greek word means deservably enjoys a good reputation. Deservably enjoys a good reputation. That's what that admirable means. It means that it, it, it deserves a good reputation. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul, um, 13, Paul says to us, Love believes the best about another person. It refuses to believe any evil report about a brother or sister until there is certain evidence to establish it. That's what you would call admirable. That somebody comes up to you and they start accusing someone that you choose to believe something good rather than something bad until some proof actually comes from it. But see, sometimes we believe anything that somebody tells us. Somebody comes up to you and starts talking about me for example, and tells you something about me, you know, or, or, or even somebody that you might know, we, we, we have a tendency to want to believe those things pretty quickly. But admirable is, 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 is maybe doing something like this, you know. Brother, I, I, hear, I hear you saying this. Hold on a second. Dial phone number. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. This guy wants to talk to you. That's admirable. Because you don't want to be on someone's side. You want to resolve the situation. But in our relationships, in our, in our humanness, in our selfishness, we want people to be on our side. Somebody starts talking bad about other people. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Unless they start to talk about things and you say, we, I need to pray for them because this stuff is going on. Whatever the case may be. But... Be admirable, he says. Be admirable. Whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, he goes on. Excellent means moral virtue. Moral virtue. It's the same word in the Greek that is used in uh, Peter. Second Peter. Peter uses this. He says in chapter 1, verse 3 of Second Peter. Chapter 1, verse 3 of Second Peter. He says... His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. And then he says again in one five, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith excellence. Excellence means moral virtue. Guys, this is not about the power of positive thinking. It's not about the power of positive thinking. This is about the power of our hope in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. This is first and last about Christ through which all things flow and are sustained. Amen? This is about Christ. What we think about is a result of who we love. Controlling our thoughts by thinking about Christ, what is true, what is noble, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable, and excellent and praiseworthy. These are the things we need to think about. So he tells us what we need to think about. 
Okay, great. Awesome. That's what I need to think about. But how do I go about thinking that way? How? You know, it's easy for somebody to say, this is what you need to do. I can remember getting trained on some things and people tell you what you need to do, but they won't bother to tell you how to do it. How many of you have ever been around somebody like that will tell you what to do, but they won't take the time to spend with you to show you how to do the thing that you need to do? Well, God's not like that. <laughs> He'll allow life circumstances to show you how to do these things, not just what to do them. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 10. We're going to start. Oh, we'll start in verse 1, just because I like reading the scripture. But we're going to focus on verses 3 through 5, but we'll start in verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. I'll let people get there. Yeah? Good? All right. God's word says, through Paul, By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am, am timid when face to face with you, but bold toward you when away. He's being sarcastic there because people are trying to make his name bad. And so he's saying, these people are saying that in front of them, he's really timid. But when behind their back, he's really bold. You know, that's why he's saying that. That's why those are in quotes in my Bible. He goes on and he says, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think they, that we live by the standards of this world. Do you live by the standards of this world? Let's talk about those standards. I love this because Paul's going to now tell us how we should do this thing. Remember, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever's noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. But how? Paul's going to tell us. He goes on in verse 3. He says, For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretense, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Paul is talking about Christ living inside of us, cleansing us, purifying us, reacting, re re recreating our character into His image through the power of the Holy Spirit and giving us His will, helping us to understand what His will is. We must... We must be able to be connected to him before we understand these things. So 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 is really telling us how we should control our thoughts. So verse 5 says, We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This is the foundation of all the things that he said in the preceding text. We take captive everything. Do we take captive everything? Think about that. All the thoughts that go through our minds, do we take captive and filter them through the lens and the heart of Christ? Well, if you do, then praise God. If you don't, then you're in the right place. Because God is about to tell us how to do this. Verse 3 says, I want you to write this down. We think differently about the battles we fight. Christians, we have to think differently about the battles we fight. What battles? The battles that battle inside of you. We think differently about the battles we fight. The world wages war and fights against each other. We fight against ourselves. And those things inside of us that are contrary to God, that God might work through us to save the world. Do you realize that? When he talks about these weapons, 
He's not talking about how you take a sword and you use this weapon against your brother or sister. Remember what we have inside of us that we were not created with, and that is sin. We were not designed for this. And so what happens? We have to, in order for our character to be reconstructed, in order for us to tear down everything that, that, that is inside of us and allow God to recreate and reconstruct those things inside of us, we have to think differently. We have to give in to God. We have to use the weapons that He's given us for the sake of destroying everything inside of us before we can be of any use to anybody else in terms of His will. See, that's a change of thinking. We don't use this Bible to beat somebody in the head. We use this Bible to beat ourselves in the head. We use His Word to filter through us so that we change our thinking, that we change our thoughts. These weapons He's speaking of are not weapons for the world. They're weapons for us. You know, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but this is, this is a revelation from God. The world doesn't think this way. You use weapons to fight other people. But these weapons that God is speaking of are not weapons to fight other people. They're to fight our desires to be selfish. That's what these weapons are for. He goes on, he says, we fight against ourselves and those things. Our weapon is our faith. Our weapon is the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Our weapons are not to wage war against others, but rather to fight everything within us that is contrary to God. And all of this begins in the hearts and the minds which flow from God. Amen? Which flow from God. You know, Ephesians 6.12 says, for our struggle, listen, all different contexts now, if these weapons are to fight ourselves and internally, listen to this. Ephesians 6.12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Right before the word tells us how to dress in the armor of God. 1 Corinthians 9.27 tells us, No, Paul says, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave. I strike a blow to my body. How many of us strike blows to their body daily? I know I do. And I'm not talking about hitting myself. I'm talking about making sure that, and I'm still under construction just like all of us, but Whenever thoughts come into our mind, or or we know there shouldn't be something that is there that we're thinking about, do you pat yourself on the back and say, it's okay, God's grace is all over me? It's okay, I'm I'm under God's mercy? Or do you beat yourself and say, no, uh uh-uh, no, don't be stupid, Don't don't be thinking that way. That's not the way God wants you to think. Hey, Lord, here's the thought, here's the thought. I took you captive, here, it's yours now, what do I do with it? Rather than reacting, no, I strike a blow to my body to make it my slave. So the first point here is that we think differently about the battles we fight. They're not to battle other people. They're to battle the thing inside of us that keeps us from being who God wants us to be. Verse 4 tells us, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So the second point there is that we think differently than the world about the weapons we use to fight these battles. We think differently than the world about these weapons we use to fight these battles. We don't use self-help tools to win friends and influence people. See, that's a selfishness. You know, people that are in sales take these classes so that they make sure they know what to say and how to say it in a perfect timing so that people will engage. You know, a salesperson really tells people a lot of times, my understanding is these salespeople will, they're not selling something. They're, what they're really trying to do is tell people how much they need something. They're trying to encourage them how much they need something. We don't use these weapons for selfish purposes. 
We think differently about them. We don't use these for self-help tools. The world fights each other using pride and arrogance and stubbornness and pretentiousness and rudeness and selfishness. I'm going to say that again. Listen to this. The world fights each other using pride and stubbornness and pretentiousness and rudeness and selfishness. These are the weapons of the world that protect a sinful nature in us. They protect a sinful nature. On the contrary, though, Paul says, the weapons we use as believers have a divine power. They have a divine power. It means it's a power that doesn't come from this world. It comes from nothing anyone understands. It's a power from God. It's divine. 2 Peter 1.3 tells us, His divine power, the power of the Holy Spirit living in us is our weapon. But again, these weapons do not fight against the world uh, around us, but rather the world within us. They don't fight against the world around us. They fight against the world within us. That's what these weapons are for. That's what the Bible is for. And that's the reason you hear a lot of preachers, and I'm sure this is not the first time you've ever heard it. They say things like, when you read the Bible, don't be sitting down and, and reading the Bible and saying, see, yeah, hey, see, that's what you ought to, you, See, no, it always ought to be me. Always ought to, see, that's the weapon. That's the weapon. But see, we don't do that. We don't, we often don't do that. Whenever we hear something that we don't understand in the word, or whenever there's a preaching or a teaching that we don't understand, the first thing we want to do, if it doesn't conform with our thinking, is what we want to do is we want to push back. And we'll even have conferences with, with, the, with the teacher or somebody else and say, hey, I think you got some thinking to do here, right? Rather than allowing the word to dig inside of us, change us. Why are we so resistant to change? Why are, so, why are we so resistant to this thing that God is trying to do in us? He wants to form us into a diamond. He wants to tear down that, that huge uh, fireplace that is ugly and falling apart, and he wants to make a beautiful one. Something that will serve his purposes. Something that will warm his heart. But again, these weapons do not fight against the world around us, but rather the world within us. That the kingdom of God might live in us. And destroy all strongholds within us that are contrary to Christ, the building of his kingdom. Do you realize that the kingdom, where is the kingdom being built first, people? Where is the kingdom being built first? It's in us. It's got to be in us. With changed hearts, we demolish. You know what this word demolish means? The word demolish really means to stop it in its tracks, to knock it down. To demolish means to knock it down. That's what it means. We demolish these arguments and every pretension. Pretension is things of doubtful value to God. Things of doubtful value in our faith. Against God's truth. And we take them captive and make them obedient to Christ. We don't take them before Christ because Christ is with us fighting this battle. No, no, no. We take them before Christ because He is in us, helping us to think about how to, how to respond to these things. See, I, I imagine when I'm thinking about this that, that here, here comes a thought. Here comes something, uh, uh, a reaction or a thought that, that comes into my mind because of a circumstance or something that happened and this thought comes into my mind. Man, I think about this and the way I see this word and here comes that thought and, and, and I see it. I know it in my heart. I know there's contention there. I know there's pretension there. I know it's coming and I see it coming and what I do is I... By the neck. Hold on. Hold on. I don't know if this is right. Hey, Lord, I got this captive. Based on your word, tell me. Tell me, Lord, what do I need to do with this? React, talk, speak, or do nothing. Right? But no, a lot of us, a lot, you know what? I, I don't know if, if you've ever been in a conversation with people that either finish your sentence for you or, or, or try to, yeah, or try to, uh-huh, try to finish your sentence for you, or, or they don't really, when you're in a conversation with somebody, are you already thinking about what to say? 
That's not listening. That's not listening. If you're already thinking about what to say before the person finishes speaking, that's just rude. See, this is about rethinking the way we think. Press it down. Grab it by the throat. And say, Lord, I've got this captive. What do you want me to do with this? What do you want me to do with this thought? You want me to tell you why that's important? Because the thought turns into an action. The thought will always turn into an action. And you may say, well, that's not true, Pastor, because I don't always do something. Well, the fact that you don't do something and maybe in your mind and in your heart you get mad, that's doing something. You might treat the person different as a result, but you don't say anything to them. That's harboring hatred in your heart. We don't do that when we press down on the neck, squishing at thought and holding it captive, pressing it down, pushing it down, getting it captive. See, but, but we cannot and will never do this if we are not in Christ and we're not thinking about the reconstruction of our character. We're not going to do it. We won't do it. He says, they have divine power to demol demolish strongholds. What are strongholds? Well, the stronghold is basically sin. It is a thing that bonds us. It's bondage. And, and, and man, all you got to do is look at the world to see how strong held they are and people are i remember i was to the sinful nature but see here's the problem with all of that too is that the sinful nature becomes so norm that those are the normalities of life and not the reality of life and so you get somebody who is a light in the world that comes into that darkness and they're the ones that are ostracized don't worry about being ostracized, folks. Don't worry about being ostracized because you have an audience of one, and that's God. That's God. Strongholds, bondage, pretension, allegation of doubtful value, you know, things that, that come into your life and you doubt their value when it contrasts against what God has called you to. The weapons have divine power not just to pacify something, not just to tame it, not just to mitigate it, but demolish it, it says. Divine power is the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ in us. So we think differently than the world about the weapons we use to fight battles. And then verse 5 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See, the third point here is that we think differently about how we use these weapons. Not against them, but against all things that try to penetrate me. I don't have to belittle somebody. You know, is there sometimes when people will throw insults at me for the sake of a response? How many of us are strong enough just to let it go? You know, I got, when I was a kid, <laughs> I was going to school, and uh, some kid told me, I guess it was the first time I'd heard it or something like that, I can't remember, but some kid told me, and you've probably heard this before, you're ugly and your mama wears army boots. You've heard that before. And you, I think about it now as an older adult that said, yeah. But somebody told me at that point, I was mad. I was mad. I wanted to get a, I, In fact, I got in a fight because of it. I got in a fight because of it. And I remember my mom or my dad, I can't remember who told me. It says, Hito. That's in Spanish. It's a term of endearment. Hito. Are you ugly? Well, nobody tells me I'm ugly. So I don't think so. Okay, Hito, do I wear army boots? No, mom, I've never seen you wear army boots. And she says, 
So there you have it. It's not true. Things are going to come at us. It's not about what comes at us. It's about how we react to those things. And we cannot react to those things unless we filter them through the captivity, taking them captive, pressing them, demolishing them, and holding them down, and giving them to Christ and say, how shall I react to this? See, this is what he's trying to tell us. Our character is being built up, but we don't allow our character to be built up. You know why? Because we got all the answers. We don't have all the answers. Can you imagine if you're reconstructing your house and your house says, no, I don't want to be reconstructed. And so you try to hammer down a wall and it won't fall down. You get pretty frustrated. In Spanish, my dad used to be hammering something, you know, and it wouldn't go in. It wouldn't go in because maybe there was a knot or something like that. And you know what my dad used to say? My dad used to say in Spanish, he would be hammering it. I'll tell you in English what it means. But he's hammering. Those Spanish people are really going to start laughing about this. He started hammering this thing. He says, no se manda sola. It does not tell itself what to do. He's hammering that thing. He says, you do not tell yourself what to do, you know. He's hammering that thing in. We take captive and give those things to Christ. We beat ourselves into submission. No se manda sola. My mind does not manage itself. I have given it over to Christ. My, why? Because my heart is His. And when my heart is His, my mind is His. It's all. We think differently about how we use these weapons. The mind must be renewed to be able to discern the things that come at us from the world. We knock them down. We demolish them. Anything that sets itself up against what we know is to be true. But see, how do we know what's to be true? We got to get into His Word. We got to know Christ. We got to be with Him. We have to have a relationship with Him. And after we knock them down, we give them to God. We don't kill the person. We take the thought captive. And we give it to the Lord. See, this is not about us knocking others down. It is that we knock down, demolish what is not of Christ. We take captive. We control our thoughts and directing them to Christ. This takes us loving and trusting God. It takes us believing that God can use all that happens in our lives and in this world for our own good. Do you believe, do we believe that when we become Christians and that, that, that the evil one is not happy with what our decisions are to serve Christ? So there are going to be obstacles in our lives. There are going to be things that happen in our life. Do you think that that is for your, so, so, so that you can feel bad about yourself? No, God does these things and he allows them. He allows these things so that we can be built up in him. That's why I keep saying things like, you have a big old funnel. Everything that you pour in that funnel funnels right down to Christ. Everything in this world and in this life and the things that you do, His Word tells us that at the end, every knee will bow, every tongue is going to confess that He is the Lord. And that means that every tongue and every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that He is the Lord. Whether they are saved or not, they are going to confess that He is God. Now that, folks, is a truth. Whatever is true, Whatever is noble. This takes us loving and trusting God. It takes us believing that God can use all these that happens in our world to build our character. That's why the things happen in this world. So don't ever go and start thinking about the things that are happening in the world. Oh, woe is me. Well, Michael, now you're just being insensitive. Am I? Imagine if Christ said, oh, woe is me, he would have never gone to the cross. We have to live through these things because we think more than we... We know we think a lot. It's important that we take these thoughts captive. 
Our obedience then comes first by controlling our thoughts. And as we've learned in Romans, this is from the renewing of our heart and our minds as they are filled to the brim with Christ. As they're filled to the brim with Christ. The weapons help us to battle to not destroy the thoughts, but take them captive and give them to Christ. We cannot destroy our thoughts. They're going to come into our minds no matter what happens. They're going to come. Our job is to take them captive and make them obedient to Christ and demolish them. This, is, this can only be done when you say yes to Christ. Yes to the Lord. And no to our sinful nature. We think differently about how we use the weapons. Not against them. Against others. But against all the things that are contrary in us to Christ. Amen. So. Summarize. We think differently about the battles we fight. We think differently than the world about the weapons we use to fight these battles. And we think differently about how we use the weapons, not against them, but against all that tries to enter us for the purpose of allowing God to construct our character. Because guys, we are a character under construction. And it's going to take our thoughts to be changed. The way we think about things. Amen? So I'm going to read these texts one more time before we go. Philippians 4. I admonish you to memorize this. Let's put this up on the screen so we can read this together. And I admonish you to memorize this. And then I want you to think about the 2 Corinthians text. And this is what, what we should think about. And the 2 Corinthians text is how we should be thinking. How we should get that done. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. I want you to memorize that scripture and then remember that we fight battles and wars in this life, not with our hands and with our mouth, but with our thoughts, by taking them captive to press down everything in us that is contrary to how God wants us to respond, and that is in love. Amen? In love. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this word that you've given us, Lord. I pray that you will help us to continue to be the character, the Imago Dei, the one you originally designed. Lord God, I pray that you, we, will allow you, we will allow you to continue to tear down everything within us that is not of you so that you can build up your character, Father. That you might look upon us and as, as you did to your son, this is my son and with him I am well pleased. Father, I pray that this is our desire as we seek you, as we memorize the scripture, as we remember what you want us to think about and how you want us to think so that we, our character, might change for your glory, for your glory, Lord God, not our own. Help us to become a people, Lord, a people that love others more than we love ourselves. You are so merciful, so powerful, so great, and it is your name, in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray this morning. These things help us, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of God and remember, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy. Think about such things. Amen? Amen. Have a good Sunday. God bless you.